Thank you for coming to this intercropping session. Um, obviously, it's suddenly become really important with the recent announcement of the la latest option of SFI um, with the companion cropping. Um, no doubt that's going to come up. I've just introduced myself. I'm Jerry Olford, Senior Farming Advisor at the Soil Association. Um, been invited to chair this session. Um, I'm going to leave the three panel speakers to introduce themselves, explain what they do, um, and then we go straight into questions. You'll see on the screens in front of you there are a, a loop of slides of the, the work that Ben's been doing. They're all intercropping, just to give everybody an idea of the sort of things that they're doing. Um, but So just hand over to each of the speakers in, in turn to introduce themselves and their farming system, and then we'll get on to questions from the stand. We have a, mo a roving mic, so if you wait for the mic to arrive before you ask your question, please. Okay, Ben, start off. Morning. Uh, I can see a few bleary eyes. I hope everyone's feeling okay after last night. Um, Andy might have taken it a little bit too far, but <laughs> we'll, move, we'll move on. Um, so my name's Ben Adams. I am a farmer and full-time consultant as well. So I'm very busy. Love doing trials on the family farm back in North Oxfordshire, just outside of Bicester. We are mostly combinable cropping, trying to move off that input treadmill but trying to keep profitability at the forefront, effectively, um, as much as possible. So we've been trialling various intercropping techniques over the last few years. It originally started when um, Andy Howard came out to the farm after first my dad first came to Groundswell about four years ago. Um, and we started with linseed and oats. Oats as a, com as a companion to deter flax flea beetle. That worked really well. Um, then we started experimenting around with different things, peas and oats. Um, learned a few lessons on what to do and what not to do over the, over the last few years. Um, up until last year, I wanted to expand all the different trials and stuff that we were doing. So I applied for some funding so I could upscale it a bit. And I ended up winning a net zero bursary. Um, my argument was around constantly having a legume as a companion, so reducing nitrogen usage, hopefully reducing inputs while keeping outputs quite high, was what I sold to them anyway. Whether that happens or not, I think so. Um, so I'm doing seven different crops at the moment. I've got three legumes in there, peas, beans, and vetch. Two brassicas, got white mustard, uh, spring oilseed rape, and two cereals, barley and oats. So my idea was to have an overwinter cover crop, do all these different trials. So I've got seven different trials going on. No, sorry, nine different plow trots going on. Um, then follow that with a winter wheat crop, and then go back in in the third year with another cover crop, and back in the spring with effectively what worked well in that first year. So out of my nine different plots, I'm sure some of them will be awful. Some of them might work really well. Uh, might have to wiggle them a little bit, we'll see. Um, but there'll be some photos of the plots throughout the session, just a quick slideshow. Some of them are looking really nice, but um, yeah, I'll pass on to the rest of them. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the... Uh, event and the seminar. It's great. Uh, I made the observation yesterday. It's great to come to a farming event and have as many ladies in the audience and on the site as gentlemen. And um, that's not often a thing that happens in farming, but we all know that this is an event that's much more about farming. So thanks everybody for the support. I'm David White. I farm um, between Cambridge and Newmarket, 400 acres. I've farmed regeneratively uh, with no till. Uh, for seven years now uh, and made that work from jumping in with two feet the whole farm in one go. Um, it's a really enjoyable way of farming, uh, changed my life effectively. Um, my experience with intercropping, bicropping, whatever we're going to be calling it now is two harvests and um, I've got crop in the ground for this year. Uh, the first year was uh, as spring oats and beans, which I nicknamed boats. The second year I did the winter version of it with muscani and tundra beans. And this year 
Um, I'm growing wheat for Andy for Wild Farmed, and we have wheat and beans uh, as the by crop. And um, I'll go on to give a bit more detail about that in a minute. Hi, I'm Andy Cato. I'm, a, I'm now a National Trust tenant um, near Swindon. And um, uh, for, for several years now, I've been working on this sort of companion planting idea in the form of pasture cropping, uh, using an inter-row mower, of which a, a rather lovely version built by Trevor Tappin is, is just around the corner. Um, but as the, the Wild Farm Project developed, um, that kind of came at the same time as my discovery of Dr. Christine Jones and her sort of message about plant diversity as kind of the driver of everything. Uh, and so um, I'm now interested in, in any version uh, of systems that can bring plant diversity into the, into the crop field, not just around the edges. Uh, and so on the farm now, I'm sort of treading a delicate line between um, trying to pay the rent and find out as many things as possible every year. Um, uh, and so there's basically two lines of inquiry. Uh, one is um, using the inter-row mower, both with perennial but also annual uh, into rows. There's that Gabe Brown comment about um, getting the soil to a point where it's ready for perennials, and I don't feel that the farm that I've just taken over is. Uh, and so uh, annual clovers, annual all sorts of things um, between the between the crop rows managed by the mower, if necessary, is one thing I'm interested in. And the other thing is moving on from you know wheat and beans, barley and peas, things which are pretty tried and tested now. Um, into how complex we can get these mixed, basically harvestable cover crops is where, is where I want to get to with that. And for that to work at scale, I think it's the after harvest stuff that it really counts. Um, so with my wild farm hat on, you know, a big piece of work has been able to um, put in place post harvest cleaning so that people can do all this stuff and, and, and actually sell it. Uh, otherwise it's, you know, obviously complicated. Uh, and th there's a lovely comment recently from an Australian farmer whose name I can't remember to credit him with, but uh, he said basically let's let nature do the growing by giving all these, her all this diversity and complexity and let's use our ingenuity to separate the seeds out afterwards. As a sort of guiding principle, uh, I like that as an idea. Great, thank you guys. Um, can I just, as a first off, ask, can everyone put their hands up if you have tried or are trying intercropping, bicropping, companion cropping, um, Already, and hands down, and then hands up those who are now feeling inspired to do it or are here to learn how to do it. So they're, all lying. they're all lying, I know, but <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. That's good. Um, possibly some definitions may be useful to within this context. What are, are we talking about? What are we talking about with intercropping? And I think technically, intercropping is a mixture of two or more species growing in the same place. Defra have just called it companion cropping, we've got by cropping, we've got those, we've got pasture cropping. Those. We're talking about the whole range of things in this conversation. So, okay. Um, we may not have all the answers, but if we, um, we will try our best to help you where we can. So, really, the whole point of the panel discussion is questions. So, has anyone got a question for the panel as a whole or um, anyone specific? So, we have a question over on the far side there. We've got anyone in the front row who wants to ask a question, I can use the mic for quickly. <laughs> Do you want to quickly come up here and ask the question while the mic moves over to the other side? Um, Harvey Richards, I've, um, we farm West Midlands and we heard about wild farming yesterday. You do a bit closer to your mouth. Uh, <laughs> wild farming yesterday and um, I just interested in, is it uh, viable to grow wheat and beans, um, would, it, would we be able to sell it for enough money to make it viable to be separated by someone else? You know, or do we have to separate it on farm and then sell the two crops? Brilliant. Key question about intercropping. Is it economically viable? <coughs> David, to start with? Yeah, definitely to start with. Oh, <laughs> OK, <laughs> thanks, Jerry. Um, well, I've got a list. Uh, so I made a list last night because um, I don't like to be ill-prepared on... Um, various topics so I can answer questions on seed rates and crops tried and all sorts of things. But if we want to cut to the chase and talk about how economically viable it is, um, it is economically viable. Um, in the trials that I've done, which are tramline trials on a whole field and Wade over Weybridge, etc., uh, we can start with the land equivalent ratio. So the land equivalent ratio of a bicrop of oats and beans, um, boats, 
um, in, in both years that I've tried it compared to the monocrop grown beside it as, as um, to prove that the trial works or not was a 1.32 ratio. So we've got 1.32 um, against one output of the bicrop compared to the monocrop um, in two years running. Um, and that can be uh, translated um, either from yield or from gross margin, actually. So financially, we were better off. And uh, just in pure tons produced on that area, we were better off. Uh, I can give you a gross margin. So the gross margin of the spring boats um, two years ago, this is less separation costs, and we can talk about separation, um, was uh, 1,033 pounds a hectare, whereas the mono beans was 780 pounds a hectare. So the gross margin in favor of the by crop in that season was 230, uh, 253 pounds per hectare. So financially it works, it works on a land equivalent ratio and it also works, uh, we're all worried about our carbon footprints and how we grow um, more crops with less nitrogen, fewer artificial inputs and of course the, the by crops because the fact that it's a cereal and a broad leaf means that you can cannot apply herbicide. So in my case it would have had a um, uh, for the two spring bean and oat crops, they would have had a glyphosate seedbed cleanup, nothing else applied other than a little bit of manganese and magnesium. So no herbicides, no fungicides, no inputs effectively, um, and we're still producing a yield more than the equivalent monocrop sat beside it. Great. Okay. And did you want, did you want to add anything to that, Andy? Or? Oh, j just on the separation point, because you asked about what farm, so... Uh, to try and make this easy, we we take everything. So we um, uh, and uh, we've uh, we've now teamed up with Robin Appel, who are going to do the, all the separation for us. They've added a special machine in to be able to to, to deal with it. Uh, and so from that point, then um, we we pay the, the the agreed price on the wheat, and uh, um, and with Robin Appel, we take care of selling the beans and pass that on to the farmer. Yield will always be king to some degree, but margin is going to be what's going to make you the money. Um, and that's what I've tried to focus on with these trials. So all of mine have been into a cover crop, sprayed off, zero till drilled, and then nothing all the way till harvest. Um, so current spend, including operation costs, I've got from 270 to 370 pounds a hectare. And about half of that is the seed costs, because obviously trials, lots of different seed. Um, and four of those crops I'm growing are also three-way variety mixes, just to add a bit more um, variation and diversity. But I think from future policy and where future policy ever seems to be heading, um, when you've got companion cropping touching on at £55 a hectare, no insecticides at £45 a hectare, you've now got, well... I had £40 a hectare for intermediate soils, but now that's changed about 10 days ago. Um, but there's going to be future um, payments coming out next year for no-till and direct drilling, anyway from 50 to 125. Also, precision farming approaches, whatever that means, 10 to 50. And all of those are viable with what I have done this year, and that, that is coming to 200 to £305 a hectare. So I'm effectively, I've covered all of my variable costs already, plus the machinery costs. So anything I get on top, any yield I get on top, as long as that covers the rest of my fixed costs, I'm in the money. That's how I see it, just de-risking as much as you can. Some of those SFI long-term payments may be subject to change. <laughs> <laughs> I, thank you. Uh, it was two questions, really, but one, the main one was really on the drilling depth of the different varieties or crops. That's one, an experience and knowledge on that. And the other one was to do with the, the sale of the product, which Andy, thank you for clarifying that. There, is, there are opportunities for sale. So, thank you. Yep. Drilling depth. Yeah, drilling depths. Um, on my nine different, nope, sorry, seven different crops, largest from beans, smallest to mustard, have all gone in an inch and a half, all down the same row all have come up. I really don't think drilling depth is much to worry about as much as people do. As long as the seed's in the ground, it will do well. I mean, most people plant oilseed rape down the back of a subsoiler leg, and God knows how deep some of that goes sometimes. So, And that's a tiny little seed. I don't see it as much of an issue. Um, 
just pigeon control when you've got beans and peas is the only thing to worry about, and they are a annoyance. <laughs> yeah, um, drilling depth, um, pretty flexible, really. The first year um, with the trial, I mixed the two seed types together uh, in a grain bucket, uh, so it was it was oats and beans mixed together down the same spout from the same drill hopper, all put in an inch and a half. That worked really well. The second year with the winter version of that, um, it was convenient because my tine drill happened to have winter beans in anyway. So I used the tine drill for winter beans and then over sowed with the avatar which had the oats in and um, now going on with the avatar with uh, three seed hoppers. Um, it's, it's very easy to do either alternative rows, one colt a row deeper than the other, so the beans go in a bit deeper um, than the oats, or put them all in together. But it's pretty flexible. I do think that beans like to be in at two or three inches, um, and so this year with, with the uh, bicrop um, wild farmed uh, area that I'm growing, I actually pulled the beans in with the tine drill again deeper and then cut the wheat in above. But um, it's not something to worry about. You don't need separate hoppers. It will work with the two seed types co-mingled down the same spout. I just, just add quickly on that. There's a, yeah, I, I, I asked myself this question repeatedly insofar as because I was coming at it from the pasture cropping thing, so I'm set up on 50 centimetre centres in kind of like a strip till setup basically, and all of my drilling um, a, a equipment works around that. So I've always got the option of doing, for example, wheat, beans in alternating rows, and I have done that, and it looks really nice. Uh, and also there's some, there's some research papers that, that show that in alternate rows, well, the bean biomass was 75% higher. The wheat biomass was unchanged. Um, but then uh, the corollary of that is then when, it, when you're just waiting to harvest, things are drying out, there's a far higher wheat burden uh, in those bean rows when they're, when they're drying off in my because I'm not using any any herbicides or pesticides of any sort um, and then there's the other sort of overarching um, thing of just trying to keep things simple uh, and um, and so this year I did quite a lot of the mixes um, just putting everything in, in in the same hopper and doing what most of the wild farm growers are doing um, and I'm coming down on, on on that side of things actually just keep it simple uh, just come, I've just come back from Denmark where um, some research work out there as part of a project, which I'll mention at the end. But um, they're, they're even doing spring beans and peas drilled into winter cereals. So they come back in and so they have a winter cereal over winter and then they drill into that as long as the varieties will work to come to harvest at the same time. So, yeah, I think the yeah, message, don't get wrapped on the complexities. Life is simple. Nature is simple and it does things its way and we're trying to be clever. Next question. Um, is it important to start with a blank canvas? What do you do if you haven't got one? And is it, can we tolerate weeds? Is that, I, I don't really, I'm a bit on the fence about weeds and whether they're. Uh, as an organic <laughs> advisor, I can answer that one quite very easily, but I'll hand it over to the other ones. <laughs> do you want yeah, yeah, I mean, um, so it's easier if you start with a blank canvas. Um, <laughs> And actually, uh, Frederick Thomas, who's speaking here today, who I know reasonably well, I've visited his farm. He did a lovely presentation for us, uh, a webinar thing for BASE uh, a couple of winters ago, where he talked about actually the, the planning of, of something like this. So the, to make this work really well, you have to think ahead. So um, if you've got a clean field um, from the previous year, rather than legacies of other things going on, it makes it much easier because you can't effectively use a herbicide, and with the wild farm, we're not using herbicide. The legacy of the field where my wheat is for Andy, um, it, it has quite a checkered history. In the, in the past, I've grown my cover crop seed plots on it, so there will have been an area of phacelia, an area of buckwheat, and various other things. And last year, that was two years ago, last year I grew some heritage wheat varieties, um, treated and untreated to see how they... Um, compared with modern wheat varieties. So it, the, the, the field where the wild farm crop is has a checkered history. Initially, when the wheat and beans came up, there was some phacelia with it, and I got a bit nervous and thought, this is worrying. The phacelia can grow into quite a vigorous plant. Is this going to take over? But it didn't. 
that everything kept in balance. The phacelia started to flower and started to look nice. We can talk about how many insects are in this crop compared to a monocrop. Um, there were also some poppies there, and I got a bit worried being, uh, having been a conventional farmer for 40 years, and you know, it's, it's a sin if you've got some poppies in your field. And actually, they started to flower. There weren't too many of them. They clearly weren't going to be an issue, certainly this year. And I, and I quite enjoyed having the poppies as well. So the diversification, I think, um, can add something to it. I haven't found the weed burden um, to be a problem. What if you started with a horse's field, like the grass and... Ah, uh, well, that's, that's Andy, <laughs> Andy's speciality, so... Um. No, I mean, I've always farmed organically, so I've probably got a, um, a different version of what a successful field looks like to a lot of people in this room, you know. So, But um, I, my only observation on the weeds would, would be that... Um, well, this year was just very interesting in the farm that I've just taken over. Um, because it was organic, I wasn't... I was expecting lots of things, but black grass wasn't one of them. Uh, and there's actually been loads of black grass this year. There's loads of charlock, there's wild oats, there's all kinds of stuff. But what was interesting, uh, if you can put it in quotations, um, try and look at the positive spin on it, is that in every single field where these issues are, um, and take the <coughs> case of black grass, uh, there's all kinds of waterlogging issues this spring. The more anaerobic, the more denser it was, you walk out of the anaerobic area and it just goes away. Uh, and similarly, um, where I had um, flooding on other fields that's been in grass for three years, it came out of grass with the surface cultivation into a crimson clover wheat combination. The lower half of it then, then got pretty consistently waterlogged for a long time, absolutely full of charlock. So that's obviously a pain, but on the other side, it's just evidence again and again and again that the plants that we don't want are symptoms of the soil environment. And so whilst we need to be careful to not keep replenishing these weed banks again and again and again. Ultimately, I think that it's getting the soil to a place which doesn't suit those plants, which is the best protection. Well, to start off cropping from a, from a pasture, well, you either spray it off or plough it, don't you? I mean, I don't, there's a million... I mean, uh, having said that, last year, um, last year I got rid of pastures using just um, a thing called a trefler, which is basically a sweep tie cultivator that goes in a couple of inches deep. And that worked really nicely, but it worked because it was a drought. You know, had it rained halfway through that process, it wouldn't have worked. But that was that was nice because that did avoid the disturbance. Anything to I need to be careful what I say about weeds, especially with my, my agronomist standing at the back of the tent over there. Good luck, Joe, next year. Um, <coughs> it doesn't seem to be too much of an issue yet, considering... So the previous cover crop that was before these two trials... Uh, didn't get going. It grew more in October than it did in September and August together. And it was basically a mat of black grass over the winter, apart from like three mustard plants that survived. Um, and one of these fields is quite tight, it's a bit compact, and there is black grass in that field. But there's also black grass in winter wheat fields that have had a full pre-em stack and a six feet tall poking out the top of the wheat. And they have got 20, 30, 40 tillers on and their seed heads are about three or four inches long. In this field, with no inputs, no, um, no mineralization from a drill going through, apart from a little disc of the avatar, the black grass has one, maybe two tillers. The seed heads are about an inch high. And considering it's had nothing, it's quite surprising. Um, if you're not feeding those weeds, they aren't much of an issue. But there are still broadleaf weeds in there as well. You can see down there, um, there's cleavers, there's little thistles, there's cranes bill. But none of them are very tall. They're not poking out the top. All they're doing is they're just covering the bottom of the soil. I think we do need to just be a little bit more tolerable and stop squealing if we see one weed in the field. <laughs> as long as it's not robbing yield, I don't see an issue with it. Um, just follow up on that, Innovative Farmers ran a trial as part of the Diversify project a few years ago and in an organic farm that had a big wild oat problem by growing an intercrop of beans and um, wheat. He actually had a reduction of the wild oat population to the extent that he now continually intercrops solely to control the wild oats because organically we haven't got a, a method of controlling it sensibly. It's a problem he has, he uses the intercrop as his weed control system because we think the diversity conversation under the root ground means the soil realises there's more than one crop having a demand. But I don't know. It's science, which we don't all understand. Next question. 
Uh, two questions. Firstly, if you find a, rota uh, a mix you like, can you grow it continuously if it contains wheat? And secondly, combine, setting up the combine, what's ne does the losses increase or what's acceptable losses? Okay, so rotation and combine settings, two different questions, but interesting. Um, I guess I'm going to find out about rotation because I like to uh, home save a lot of oats, linseed, peas, beans to put in cover crops because I don't like spending 40, 50 pound a hectare on cover crop seed. I'd rather spend 15. Um, so I'm not sure of that. I think it's more of an issue nematode wise with pe peas and beans, but I mean, I guess I'm going to find out. But I. I am of the opinion if the, if there is an, as much diversity as possible within the rotation, hopefully it can map balance itself out. Whether that's true in theory, I don't know. We'll see. Um, moving on to the combining question, it is difficult, but what you want to do is effectively set your combine up to the two extremes of the crops. So for one of my trials, I've got um, beans, oats, and spring oilseed rape. So what I'll do is I'll set the concave to the largest crop, so beans, the fan has to be to the lowest crop, so LC drape, you'll set your sieves up between the two, and the sample will be dirty, but it's just one of those things, you just got to deal with it. There will be some weed seeds in there, um, but that's for the separators. MacArthur Zagri are in here, so go and ask them all those difficult questions, but yes, it's possible. Yeah, a really similar comment with the combine settings. Uh, first year we did this, it was a class with an automatic fancy system and it sort of set itself, I'm assuming, for the beans um, and we got quite a nice sample um, and it wasn't an issue. Uh, the combine I'm using now is uh, manual setting, so I'm setting again for the beans. What is important actually is that you don't smash the, the pulse element up um, so that the chips and bits are the same size as the grain element and it makes the cleaning very difficult. So uh, usually with oats, uh, they separate quite well because they'll blow out easily on a windy day. Wheat perhaps um, not so, but we just need to leave it to be ripe so that it does thrash and separate easily. But the crucial thing is that you don't smash your um, pulse element up and, and contaminate your cereal element. Yeah, I think that's all the exact ditto for the combines. Um, the, the rotation point is, a, is an interesting question, you know, and uh, is, is rotation a response to the disease pressures you get from monocultures? And if you get away from monocultures, you don't need to bother anymore. Uh, and my, my gut feeling that the answer is to that is probably yes, if you can get the mix complex enough. Um, but um, obviously the, uh, and the bean and the pea nematode we'll, we'll, we'll have to see. An interesting, I uh, read an interesting paper recently about maslins, there's a word I have never heard of before, but it's, um, it's basically just growing different cereals together as well. It was a, a study mainly focused in, uh, in Africa where there was rye and barley and wheat and um, oats and all these different combinations used for different things. But now we're living in a world of, of colour sorters. Um, uh, that's, that's another interesting idea as well, because if we can get these, these uh, these mixtures as rich as, as grassland mixtures, well obviously grassland mixtures don't rotate and they don't have massive disease pressure. So I think it's an exciting idea that we could perhaps get to, to autumn and spring mixtures which take us out of the rotation um, headspace. I would caveat that by saying that none of this gets around the basics uh, of, um, well in my case, you know, non-herbicide farming where if you've got certain weed burdens then you need to do all the sensible things to deal with weed burdens that, that no amount of, uh, um, by cropping into cropping is going to solve that. Yeah. David, as the only guy who's actually done the combining, um, were there more losses, or did you feel there was more losses out the back of the combine as a result? Uh, no, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say there was there was an issue at all. But it, it's 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 really like Ben said. You you set the concave for the largest and the wind for the smallest, and the separation does the cleaning that ordinarily some of that you would expect the combine to do. Tiered options for herbicides with peas and oats. Uh, sorry, I don't know if everyone heard that. Growing peas and oats together, I have very limited options for herbicides. Uh, I use glyphosate to make sure I've got a clean start. If we were to lose glyphosate through regulation or through the development of resistance, I don't want to return to ploughing. Have the panel any alternative methods of cover crop, crop destruction and um, what have they found most effective? 
Um, I, well, I'm, I'm going to answer briefly from an organic point of view, is that a plough is a tool in a system. It's not... If it's the be-all and the end-all, the most important thing... I would actually criticise the power hour more for soil destruction. It's in the system. It's a tool, same as everything else. So it can be used. It's not the end of the world, OK? Just don't use it every, 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 every year, which we don't in organic. David, cover crop destruction without glyphosate. Uh, cover crop destruction. I did some trials with in innovative farmers uh, several years ago now where we crimped and rolled and flailed. We crimped and rolled in the frost and we flailed. Um, all all uh, measures were successful. Getting up in the morning when it's um, 3 a.m. to get a minus five frost is not something I'm awfully keen on. Uh, we got a lot of... We had 10 days of minus 10 last year, which killed just about everything, no matter... You didn't need to do anything to it. So that was much easier to manage, and, and um, because of that fact, um, cover crops will be easier to manage on the continent than they are in this country. But there will always be a little black grass and brome and some other bits and pieces lurking in the bottom that need dealing with, and that's where the light cultivation comes in. On the wild farm bit for Andy this year... Um, uh, really going back to your question, how do you manage without glyphosate? I get asked that question all the time, being a no-till farmer. And I thought, well, the only, the only way to find out is to try, isn't it? And so that's why I've teamed up with these, these guys, because I've got to work out how to do it. Um, light cultivation is not something I'm used to, but um, I, I, I think well-timed. And we had a very dry February this year. And we ha which followed some frosty weather, so I could get on in the frost without causing any damage to the soil, and the February period um, enabled things to dry out and die, which probably was unusual. So you've got to, you've got to assess each season as it comes along. Um, but just going back to um, Jerry's point about ploughing, we had this, I had this conversation with some uh, people yesterday, and actually, um, even though we've you know, we're, we're interested in soil health, our soil structure, our worm population, um, um, the uh, structure that the um, cro um, cover crop roots have enabled us to have. If we had to plough once in six years, would that be so, so desperately bad? Because we would start off from a very good place and therefore I would think the recovery would be very good. So... I haven't necessarily ruled out the fact that within, within the rotation that I'm growing for Andy, at some point, we might actually have to ha have a reset and, and plough again. And I would point out that when I look about ploughing, ploughing is not 8 inches and 10 inches and 12 inches deep. It's 3 or 4 inches deep. It's shallow. So, you know, that, again, will mitigate a lot of the potential damage of using a plough in a system. But, again, it's not all the time. Question here. Did you want? Did, did you want to add at all? Well, no. Only, only in the you know all the sort of the evidence that I've seen uh, is that um, <coughs> highly biodiverse farming systems, um, the creating a rich soil biology, um, that use some tillage, can push soil in the right direction. No-till systems that don't have any plant diversity and therefore rich soil biology are not pushing soil in the right direction. So it's, I don't think not tilling in and of itself answers the question. The, the interesting question, that, which is not black and white, and you just pick your shade of grey, I think in a high biology, diverse farming system, uh, when you want to, uh, in that context, when you want to terminate a cover crop, which is better, a buffer dose of glyphosate or some surface cultivation? Well, I don't know what the answer to that is. So we're actually, we've commissioned some research to try and have a look at that, that question. But I just think that... The plant diversity is such a powerful force that if that's in the system, it's a lot more tolerant to, to, to tillage if, if it's required. Here. Okay. Um, I, ju I just wanted to ask your views on the, you know, the possibility that there might be a ceiling or um, limitations in the use of the sort of mainstream varieties and breeding that are designed in a, in a, for, a, for a monoculture um, environment. And if so... Um, what role development in breeding and genetics could make this, you know, hugely more successful? So, you know, the systems that you're working on could, could improve their success. Very broad question. Um, Varietal choice for the right place is massively important. You know, and so yeah, plant breeders producing the 
varieties that work in a different farming system is something we use from an organic organization have been talking about for a long time. Um, it's, it's a bit niche. This is not going to be niche. So maybe, maybe there will be a, it'll be, it will drive in the right direction. But comments, please. Yeah, I think it's an issue that needs to be addressed. I'm not doing any like YQ population wheats or anything like that, but 70% of my milling wheats in the ground this year are blends. They're variety blends. A uh, three-way mix, a five-way mix, and a seven-way mix. Because we just need more diversity in the system and a, a monoculture of a group one milling wheat, uh, we're all desperate for a new variety. Everyone, for years and years, we've been desperate for it, and there isn't one. I don't know how we get around it. My way of getting around it is just doing variety blends and just home saving. But, yeah, I agree it's an issue, and we need to look at it. But how I m do my varieties is mostly on... Uh, ma their maturity dates and disease susceptibilities, effectively. Um, yes, I've been growing a blend of milling wheat, uh, group one wheat on the farm now for probably six years. Um, it, it's, it's tested after harvest, so I know it's clean and can go back into the ground. It goes across the dresser, so it's clean of weed seeds. And I would like to think that that, that over a period of time probably adapts itself to my soil type growing conditions and, and farming style, I don't know. Um, so growing blends isn't, isn't a new thing. Um, and certainly the spring wheat that I'm growing for Andy this year is a blend of three varieties. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said for having some diversity uh, within, within a crop and, and, and get away from total monocrops. Yeah, all, all, all of the above, really. I mean, with, with my wild farm house, we, we provide um, growers who want to use it with, with the best blends that we can come up with in every, any given winter or spring of varieties so to, suited to low input systems. Um, um, I'm also multiplying up various different uh, populations of, uh, of wheats from, from, from all over the place, Anders Borgen or uh, Belgian research institutes and so on and so forth. It would be really nice if it wasn't so damn complicated to then distribute that seed to other people and hopefully that day will come. Um, there was an interesting uh, research piece where th there was the Jena crop trials in, in uh, Germany where they, sort of over a 15 year period, basically demonstrated that biodiverse mixtures, unsurprisingly, have a massive impact on insect populations, soil health, all, all the things that you would expect. But when they compared um, the results of that to um, uh, diverse cropping mixtures, what they found was um, that when you get all these plants associated with each other, they put more of their resources into vegetative growth. Um, so in the, uh, in the, in the, a, a concrete example of that is that my crimson clover is about you know five feet high in places because it's just going up to, 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 to go up with the wheat. Um, uh, and so they put less resources into into seed, into reproductive growth. Despite that, the biodiverse mix, as David was saying, consistently outperformed the, the monocultures. But what they, when they compared it to the Aner experiments in those diverse grassland systems, um, there was no um, uh, change in resource allocation in those plants. So basically what they were saying was, we bred all these plants to just put all their resources into these massive seed heads. Uh, and so when we then throw them into these more complicated situations, they're not quite allocating their resources as they should. So I think there'd be some fascinating um, crop development to be done for mixes. Uh, now, whether you just do that by putting together mixes and saving the seed and saving the seed and saving the seed, I don't know. I guess it depends. I, I don't know enough about that. But it depends if you're going into the beginning of that process with the right genetics and sufficient genetics, I suppose. Brilliant. Hi there. Um, one thing that hasn't been mentioned is harvest maturity. It, whilst you're waiting for your beans to be ready and your oats are blowing around in the wind, is that causing you a headache or are you finding that the crops are coming to maturity at the same time? That's <coughs> Excuse me, it's a really interesting one. Um, I had a, a, a group of Camgrain colleagues around the farm um, in the first year with the spring boats and, and um, this was way before harvest and there was all sorts of discussions as to um, how you harvest that combined crop because the beans clearly we thought would be like big 
fat green broad beans that you'd, you'd have for your dinner at night and the oats would be ready. And then somebody said, well, if you lifted the cutter bar high and took the top off the oats and then harvested it a second time and got the beans the second time, um, that might be a solution. And then we talked about swathing and all sorts of things. But actually what happened is both crops came to maturity together. And there's some kind of synergy between growing things together that, that means that they, they grow together, they mature um, they sort themselves out as far as uh, the vegetative population of each species, and uh, they came to harvest together. They came to harvest, we harvested the bicrop probably a week before the monocrop beans were ready, um, so that clearly the beans had ripened early in the oats, um, and the uh, beans were 18% moisture at harvest time, and the oats were 16% moisture on that occasion. So they would store together really well with ambient air or on an air floor um, until the, it was time to separate. So, you know, there, in my experience so far, there hasn't been an issue. I, I was just speaking to, to Ben Taylor Davis about this uh, the other day because I've just never had an issue, um, uh, same experience. And, and he was explaining uh, the mechanism of this, uh, and I just can't remember the name of the thing that's emitted, but as a plant goes into maturation, it emits something beginning with E, which has <laughs> escaped me. But um, uh, but it, it means that the, the plants um, around it um, they, um, they 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 go into the same process. So there's, he was basically what has observed time and time again of this coming together. Um, it was interesting to extend, understand the process behind it, but it does happen. I think it's ethylene or ethene. I can't remember which one. Ethylene. One of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well done. <laughs> um, no, they do they do seem to come together. The first year we did our peas and oats. The peas were ready and the oats were too far behind and we had to spray it. We had to glyphosate it in order to harvest those oats because um, the maturity isn't quite right. Some of these crops will be a bit away. Um, in the second year, we drilled the oats first and then the peas and that worked a lot better. We didn't have to spray it off, although we did lose our nerve and put pod stick on because we got scared. <laughs> um, but so I've changed them a little bit so they do seem to come together a bit more maturity wise but you just got to wait a few more days is is the real answer they do they do come together a lot more than you would expect um, just hope and hold and pray there's no rainstorms because <laughs> we do need to add some stress into harvest time don't we that's the thing <laughs> next question um, do you mind just expanding a bit more on rotation? Are you intercropping every year, or are you just doing it one in three? Can you give us some examples of your current rotation? Um, no. I, I will be doing this experiment, intercrops, wheat, intercrops, probably back into wheat again, to be honest. Um, but because I'm not going full scale... Well, I mean, if some of these do really well and they look really promising, I will upscale it. Um, the ones I've done, the fields I've done in the past have not been bigger than 10 hectares or so um, for peas and oats. No, that's a lie. About 15 hectares the last two years we've done for peas and oats. But I mean, if, if they're looking promising, I'll scale it up a lot more. But I think rotationally, there's a hell of a lot more diversity in this compared to a standard oat or a standard pea crop, for example. Uh, we went cold turkey about three years ago uh, on our farm. And we, to suppress the weeds, going back to the weed question, we understood with clover. Um, question really for Andy, you mentioned your clover's growing up with your, with your wheat. Ours has been drowned out, our wheat's been drowned out by the clover. Do you have any way of checking the clover? And the second question is, we've got really good at growing crops, uh, docks on our farm. Anything to uh, neutralize those guys? Uh, well, on the clover point, I mean, that... that when I started with the pasture crop thing, I ended up with the with the mower um, to deal with the issues because I just couldn't get it to work reliably. I mean, some people seem to be able to get the the living mulch thing going, um, but it didn't work for me sometimes, but not reliably. Uh, and so that's why I ended up with uh, with the mower. The clover that I was talking about um, being really really tall, uh, I've actually done that on a strip system because, as I was saying in the beginning, at the moment I'm working with annuals, and what was worked fantastically well this year was uh, crimson clover as an autumn sown companion um, to, to wheat. It's an absolutely beautiful plant, and you can't grow a more beautiful plant. Uh, and um, I did that before in France, um, sowed it with some, some rye, uh, and it all came to maturity at the same time, so I harvested it, 
and uh, look, looking at that, I might lose a little bit of clover seed, but it's looking like the same thing's going to happen with the wheat. So that was in a, in a, in a strip system where I was kind of thinking I was going to mow the clover, um, and the establishment wasn't great for various reasons to do with my stocks cedar, but th there was enough of it to, to get the idea. And in the end, um, I couldn't mow it when I was going to because it was never stopped raining, um, which I'm really glad about because actually it, where the establishment of the clover was decent, it, it, it didn't need it. It's f I just find it's left alone. Docks. Docks. I don't have cows, so I don't have docks. <laughs> Uh, dock control is one of the tricky ones in in a organic type system, um, and if you're not using pesticides or chemicals, um, some evidence that it it is a soil based thing. There's P and K issues at depth. There is, and I often with organic when we're talking to this, docks are a bully. So how do you deal with a bully? You cut them off, attack them at source, and at source with a dock is down in the ground. They're great big, wide things up on top, but their roots go down. There's nothing else down there. No other plant puts its root down there because our system doesn't allow it. So getting deep-rooting things into the system does seem to uh, reduce the instance of docks. But biblically, weeds are there to test us. You know, there's a reason for it. So we just got to work with them in a way we can. There's no magic gun in a non-pesticide situation, I'm afraid. Next question. Thanks very much. Um, I don't know if you were in the Joel Williams presentation yesterday, but he made that last point about um, putting chicory and plantain and other deep rooting stuff to try and get rid of dogs. Uh, I'm Phil White, um, farming in Oxford. Um, we're into our first year of wild farmed wheat with a uh, clover understory. And I just wondered if the panel had any comments about integrating livestock into these sort of systems. I'm still reeling a bit because I don't know if anyone else was in the big top with Nicole Masters and. The last question was, what was your unpopular opinion? And she said, well, perhaps we don't need livestock. And as a stockman who has a bit of arable, <laughs> I'd just be really interested, either in the context of a grazing a winter crop with, with, with sheep or whatever, like we did this year, or in a spring crop situation where you're grazing cover crops and then trying to get a spring crop following on. Personally, I'll answer that one. First of all, I think you do need livestock in an arable system, full stop. Um, to graze and manage over winter, maybe. It doesn't have to be your livestock, someone else's, to manage the cover crops, to reduce it. The living mulches we looked at, you know, trying to control those clovers, the best way to do it is over winter and let the crop grow away again. But that's a personal opinion. I, I feel it's massively important that livestock in that system are part of it. Um, and it does work with Andy's system from before, with grazing the cover, the, the pasture cropping, to take out the, the grass, allow the the cereal crop to then grow away. So a personal view to that one would be livestock are important. Not essential, definitely beneficial. It's just one of the easiest ways to introduce livestock into an arable system. Get, let them graze your cover crops. Like you said, let them graze your wheats before they're starting to get going or your other cereals. Just get that tiller in, the golden hoof as they call it. Yeah, I mean, I, I systematically graze winter cereals. You know, we really encourage all wild farmers to try and integrate livestock, try and help people to do that with flying herds or whatever. I mean, it's hard to quantify all these things, isn't it? There's so many variables. But I think my starting point always is the more complex, the better. Um, and, uh, and and having livestock there is, an, is another whole layer of complexity. I mean, the biology in that in that, in that that dung that's sitting in the fields is of extraordinary levels of complexity. Now, that, that's not there for nothing, I don't think. Um, and um, and it's just insurance as well, you know. So when I was doing the, the, the partial cropping trials at the beginning, it often didn't work. And having a grass-fed beef herd on the side meant that you, you've got to get out of jail card. So I think adding complexity and reducing risk uh, is, is, is why I would, I would stick with the livestock. I, I haven't got um, livestock on the, fa on the farm at the moment, but I, I feel I need some to help manage the rotation and this sort of question uh, or answer can answer several questions so uh, somebody talked about rotation and I'm I'm therefore after harvest coming up to year two on the wild farmed rotation how do I manage that somebody talked about can we have too many pulses in the system are we going to build up a problem um, how do we manage that um, so my ideal scenario at the moment is to 
perhaps have a flying flock of sheep on the farm to graze a, a nutrition building cover crop that doesn't necessarily have pulses in it but, but features vetches or mustard or uh, um, clovers and other things and not purely peas and beans get the sheep in graze it off a couple of times um, graze it off hard in the spring and then go into spring barley after some light tillage and not have a not have a, a by crop element to the barley but have the barley grow on its own as barley following the the management from the um, appropriate cover crop and sheep management over winter and and that's the sort of thing i'm working on now to make the rotation sustainable but not rely on having beans as a support crop to a cereal crop every year brilliant yeah, I think for arable farmers who don't have livestock, you don't buy a combine and expect to, to maintain it. Why not get someone else to bring in the management system to graze it? And they're, they're someone else's, they're not yours. You're on the end of the phone. If, if they get out, you ring them. You don't go chasing sheep in the morning. It's the last thing you need to do on a Friday night. Next question over there. Um, yeah, you've sort of slightly answered it or sort of said something towards it in your last response, but I was just wondering... Uh, with the diversity and the rotation, that all of these uh, companion crops are leguminous. Um, just wondering if you've looked at any other uh, sort of plant types to bring in as uh, companion plants. Um, and I get the reasons behind using the legumes from partly their saleability and the nitrogen fixing um, ability of them as well. But just wonder if you had looked at any any different plants. Yeah, and you don't necessarily have to take them all to harvest. Um, how we originally started was linseed and oats, using the oats as a deterrent for flax flea beetle, and it worked really well. Um, the other easy way is just with your oilseed rape. Buckwheat, simple, cheap. If you want to go a bit nuts, put some fenugreek and bursting clover and all other bits and pieces with it. But, yeah, no, there's definitely opportunities there. And if you can get use cheap home-safe seed as well, I think it's a really easy win. Yeah, I tried linseed with um, with some spring wheat this year. Uh, two different seed rates. I think there's a linseed is a fantastic plant. When we used to grow linseed on a larger scale commercially, we always got fantastic wheat behind it. Never understood why until you get your head around mycorrhizal fungi and soil health and all the other things that obviously that crop um, influences in a massively positive way. Um, and so linseed is something. Whilst the flax flea beetle had it this year. Uh, when sown with the spring wheat uh, and it hasn't been successful, perhaps I didn't use enough high enough seed rate. But, um, yeah, there are other options and we just need to experiment and get a head round how to make those work. Yeah, agree, agreed. And I think it's just seeing not, not necessarily wanting to take everything to harvest, but seeing is it for these, these other, other roles. You know, if you've got a, you've got a clean field, um, it comes back to the grazing a bit, but if you've got a clean field and you, and you know that you can graze the wheat if it gets ahead ahead of winter, and you could, therefore you can sow early, that opens up all kinds of opportunities. There's, you know, there's lots of American farmers who are sowing tillage radish with their wheat, a couple of couple of pounds an acre, with great great results. So if you're in that September window, and you can put some 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 buckwheat, some tillage radish in there, some linseed in there, uh, all kinds of things that will just kind of disappear over the course of the season, but the but the, the job is done. Okay. A few questions from the back. They've been at the front, so if there is anyone at the back, there's a couple of hands up at the moment, so that'd be great. Um, yeah, just to follow up on that question, on you know, effectively, you can grow anything in the same field as something else. It's a question of what you want to do with what you're producing and what its role is. Um, go to Tim Parton's, and he's got bursine clover flowering in his oilseed rape, which is dying off. So he's still got feed for beneficials. It goes through the combine. Seed comes out the back. He's reseeding. It's it's it isn't about always producing a, a, a crop. Hi. Any experience with by cropping with lupins? I'm afraid not. No. Tim Parton's probably the man there. Isn't yeah. He? Tim would be the man there. Um, yeah. I saw some some by cropping in Denmark. It's quite a common pro crop. Um, it actually does help against the by crop. The nurse crop effect of the uh, cereal does actually protect it quite well because uh, lupins is quite a weak crop to going. And then you end up with the same issue of combi combining date and separation. So, yeah, it's a potential, massive potential. Uh, we, we grow wheat for feed for the dairy farm. Um, have you any experience of using uh, two crops and how you'd use that as an animal bedding? 
if you collect the straw? Yeah, well, um, there is quite well-known organic farming practice of, of, intercrop, of, of an intercrop crop combined producing a straw with quite a high nutritional value and a grain which uh, we've had samples tested at 17% crude protein of a mixed um, wheat, uh, spring barley and, and bean or pea or lupin. So that's equivalent of a 300 pound a ton um, dairy food. It's all in one bag. It doesn't have to be mixed. It just has to be put through a mill. Um, and then you've got a quite high value straw crop at the end as well. So yeah, it's always been part of the bag. Biblically, I'm going back to biblically, tares, the story of tares in the, in the Bible when he went out and harvested them separately, that's intercropping. Um, dredge corn was mentioned in Hansard in 1906. Dredge corn being oats and barley, for those of you who come from Devon. Um, it's been a common practice. we just got to remember, work out how to use the modern tools to make it work. Yeah, j just following on from that, and I'd got an and finally <laughs> comment, but it seems appropriate to put it in now. Many of you that have been through agricultural education will have relied on the agricultural notebook, that little green book, um, for loads of facts and figures. It's been going since the 1880s, I believe, and in the 13th edition, which was 1958, um, there's a little section in there where it refers to the fact that a mixed crop of beans with cereal often gives higher yields than these crops grown separately. And it, it really just goes to show that there's, there's nothing new in life. And, and you, following Andy's comment, um, we went through the green agriculture revolution where we bought lots of bags and cans. We forgot some of this stuff that we, farms relied on before then, but it, it worked then and it still works today. Yeah, we have only got five minutes with no current hands up, I don't think. I won. One more question and then we'll wrap up from the panel. So, Hi. Yeah, just a question on how you're treating seed royalties. <laughs> I'll leave that to the, the panel. <laughs> the easiest way is just to divide it up by percentages, effectively. If you do it by ton, it's probably the easiest, rather than a per hectare, if you're only using a small amount. Try and do it per ton if you can, or per kilo. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same. So I will use um, beans as part of a cover crop mix, for instance, and I will declare uh, a tonnage of beans on my royalty return because that's only fair, but it will be proportionate to the amount that I've used. So perhaps um, if, if beans is a third of the mix, I will you know, divide the hectares by a third or whatever. But yeah, I think it's important that... Um, we make a return and we express as fairly as we can the fact that we have used something. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you for attending. I just want to highlight, um, I've been I'm working as part of a project called Leguminos, which is looking at intercropping of um, beans, peas, and cereals. So if you're interested in being involved in a trial or following it, come and see me um, and whatever. Um, other than that, just follow-up comments from any of you three, just to finish up. Anything to say? All I would say is just just try a tram line of something on, on the farm. Just, just have a go, because until you do, you don't realise what's possible. I'd say the same thing the gentleman was talking before about rotation. If you've got a rotation that's working, stick with it and just put, put something else with, this, with each element of it and go from there, at least on a bit. Um, yeah, just give it a go. Give it a crack not got a lot to use, just do tramline trials is the easiest way. Um, trust other farmers, talk to other farmers is the best way to learn. Um, I'm going to be doing a farm tour with Base UK, David is also a member of, on the 10th of July if everyone, anyone wants to come and have a look around. Um, also put up all the pictures, information, everything like that, all over social media, at Ben Adams Agri. Go give us a follow. <laughs> Okay, thank you all for coming. Have a good rest of the event. <laughs> <laughs>